Good morning and thank you for joining me for our Lord's Day message. I know some of you are watching at home and others have gathered in one of our house churches. Uh, wherever you are, my sincere wish is that the Word of God will encourage you today and I hope we will be able to meet all together very soon. As I did last Sunday, I'm going to take the opportunity to address our current circumstances and I'm going to do that with particular reference to our church. Times like these can be very clarifying. That is, they can help us see things as they really are and I hope that will be the case for us today. I'm going to take as our text four words in a verse in Acts chapter 2 but I'm going to have a longer reading in order to set the context. In Acts chapter 2 we have the birth of the church, the, the coming into being of the new covenant people of God. As promised, the ascended Lord Jesus and his Father sent the Holy Spirit to indwell the disciples who had gathered in Jerusalem. From that point onwards, all believers in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour would receive the Holy Spirit. God would dwell in a, a new temple, a, a living temple, his people, the church. The disciples received the Spirit and immediately began to preach the gospel to the crowds that were in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. By means of the Spirit, the disciples were able to preach the gospel in languages they had never learned. In Acts chapter 2, Luke records the sermon that the Apostle Peter preached. And I'm going to take our reading from where Luke records the response to Peter's preaching. Acts chapter 2, beginning reading at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the Apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. In these verses, we see many of the features that have characterised the life of the church for nearly 2,000 years. These features would be further developed and explained by the apostles in the book of Acts and in their letters that form part of the New Testament. And actually, we can see that the apostles simply did what Jesus told them to do. There is a thread of doctrine and practice that runs from the Gospels through the book of Acts and then into the New Testament epistles. One of the great joys I've had preaching through the Gospel of Luke is to see how the teachings of Jesus flow through to the teachings of Peter and John and Paul. What we see here in Acts chapter 2 is the preaching of the Gospel accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that has been a constant in the life of the church. Without the proclamation of the gospel, there is no church. The sign out the front might say church or cathedral, 
But if the gospel of Jesus Christ is absent, it is not a church. In these verses, we also see the administration of baptism to those who repent and believe the gospel. And this is something, that, something else the church has been doing ever since, just as Christ commanded his disciples to do. And then we see Christians gathering together. Those first believers were from a Jewish background and we're told they continued to go together to the temple and that was a natural thing for them to do. And they also gathered in private homes. Verse 46 says, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now, Christians gather together. Uh, this is a fundamental part of our faith. Indeed, this is implied in the word church. Uh, the Greek word refers to an assembly. The church is the assembly of the redeemed. So important is this that the New Testament explicitly commands us not to forsake the assembling. Unless we are providentially hindered, we are to gather with God's people for worship, to use our gifts and to encourage one another. This was one of the reasons why the COVID pandemic proved to be so difficult for church leaders everywhere. Uh, on the one hand, there is the command to gather and the desire to gather. But then on the other hand, there were the restrictions on gathering, as well as concerns about people's health and about the church's witness to the world. Now, these believers who formed the f very first local church got together regularly, daily, we're told. And in verse 42, we're told what they did. Four things are mentioned. And ever since then, these have been the four essentials of the church's life together. Look please at verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. The apostles' doctrine is a reference to teaching. When the Christians gathered, they received instruction and exhortation from the apostles and their representatives. The apostles' doctrine was the teachings of Jesus and it was the teachings of the Old Testament scriptures in light of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. One author describes it like this. It likely would have included all kinds of instruction like what we see in the Gospels and the Epistles ethical and practical teaching and a grounding in the central promise God had given in Jesus. When we go to the New Testament epistles we see an emphasis on teaching. There are many exhortations given to church leaders and to congregations to apply themselves to the teaching of God's Word, to apply themselves to sound doctrine. The word fellowship that comes next in verse 42 literally refers to sharing. In this context it included mutual support and generosity. The believers gave to those of their number who were in need. But of course it was more than that. This fellowship involved communion with each other, relationships, friendships. They were now united to each other forever. Brothers and sisters in the family of God. They shared their lives with each other. And this was so important given that in a short space of time, life would become very difficult. They would need each other's fellowship because they would feel the hostility of the world towards them and their faith. The next feature of their gatherings was breaking of bread. Now there is debate among Bible scholars whether this refers to communal meals or to the Lord's Supper. It may even refer to both. In the early days of the church it's likely that the Lord's Supper was part of the communal meal. 
the, the love feast. For what it's worth, I think the reference is to the Lord's Supper, to the ordinance that Jesus instituted before his crucifixion. And then finally there was prayer. And interestingly, in the original language, the definite article is used. Literally, the text reads, the prayers, which may suggest the use of set prayers, perhaps drawn from the Psalms or following the model prayer that Jesus had taught his disciples. Whatever the case, when they gathered together, they prayed. And again, when we go to the New Testament epistles, we see an emphasis on prayer in the life of the church. I exhort, therefore, says the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, as I said, these have been the four essentials of church life ever since. When local churches gather, there is teaching, fellowship, the Lord's Supper, and prayer. The only thing that the church does every Sunday that's not mentioned here in Acts chapter 2 is singing. <laughs> but I wonder if that is included under the category of prayers because the Jewish people would sing psalms, and many of the psalms are prayers. These four features constitute our worship. The worship is not just the singing. All that we do when we gather as God's people is worship. We worship when we read the Bible. We worship when we listen with an open heart to the teaching of God's Word. We worship when we pray and when we have fellowship, when we show love and care to each other. This we offer to God because it is fitting for us as his creatures, because it is good for us and because we want to. Worship is our response to God. We are grateful for the grace that he has lavished upon us supremely in the person and work of his Son, Jesus Christ. But back to our passage. Look please again, if you would, at verse 42. And notice the first four words. And they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. These are the words that I want us to concentrate our attention on this morning. And they continued steadfastly. And there is just one Greek word translated continued steadfastly and it means to persist in adherence to a thing or to be devoted to. Those in Jerusalem who believed the gospel and were baptised, those who formed that very first local church, persisted in adhering to these things. They devoted themselves to gathering together to receive the apostles' teaching, to have fellowship, to partake of the Lord's Supper, and to pray. They didn't just do these things every once in a while. Uh, they didn't participate in these things for just a, a few weeks and then give up. No, they persisted. They continued steadfastly. And what we see as we read on into chapters 3, 4, 5 and 6 is that the church in Jerusalem grew. And there were opportunities to bear witness to the Lord Jesus Christ to the most powerful people in the city. Now, you should always listen carefully when a preacher makes an argument from silence, uh, when he asks you to imagine something that's not in the text, but I believe that what I'm about to suggest is, is quite sound. What do you think would have happened if those who made up that first church in Jerusalem had decided to stop gathering after a couple of months? Or if they decided to gather only every now and again? What do you think would have happened if those Christian believers had not 
continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers. The church would have been considerably weaker, and it may have petered out altogether. Without the resolve and the commitment and the dedication of the people, there would not have been a church at Jerusalem at all. Now I want to be careful here. We understand that there was only a church at Jerusalem by the grace of God, by the work of the Holy Spirit. Now that was true then, and it is true today. Every local assembly of believers is a testimony to the mercy and kindness of God and to his supernatural work of grace. We understand that it was the Spirit who enabled these Christians to come together as one body and to persist in teaching and fellowship and prayer. But there was also human responsibility. And to talk about human responsibility is not to minimise the grace of God. These Christians, motivated by God's grace, relying on his grace, had to trust and obey. They had to decide to devote themselves to the life of the church. They had to persist. They had to work and strive and struggle. I am sure there were many occasions when these Christians thought to themselves, it's too hard. I don't feel like going today. It's not really very comfortable, all of us gathered in so-and-so's house. I'm copying too much criticism from my neighbours for being a disciple of Jesus. It would be easier to give it away. I'm sure they had these kinds of thoughts. I'm sure there were times when they were tired and frustrated and even very discouraged. But they decided to go along to gather with others, to participate, to receive the Apostles' teaching, to have fellowship, to pray and to partake of the supper. That's what Luke means when he says, and they continued steadfastly. Now, these Christians in Jerusalem had the Word of God, the Holy Spirit and each other. That was it. <laughs> and that was more than enough. But they had to apply themselves. They had to be committed to these things or they had no church. And that's the lesson for us in our present circumstances. At the moment, we don't have our own building. We don't even have a building that we can meet in. We have limited resources. We are a very small organisation. We don't have the institutional capacity to do major works of mercy to house the homeless or feed the hungry or provide help to addicts or to victims of human trafficking. We have no physical infrastructure aside from that vacant block at South Lismore. We have no place, we have no location that serves to draw us together. All we really have is what these Christians in Jerusalem had. The Word of God, the Holy Spirit and each other. And that's enough. Hey, more than enough. Please don't misunderstand me. But it's like COVID and now the flood has clarified this. <laughs> or, or at least it has for me. It has demonstrated what little we have in earthly terms and it reminds us that we only have a church if we want to have a church. Lismore Bible Church doesn't exist. It's only a website unless we are committed to the Apostles' doctrine, fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. We don't have a church unless we are devoted to these things and persist in adhering to them. When it's easy to do that and when it's difficult. When we feel like it and when we don't. Now from what I can see, despite all that has happened, 
We do want to have a church. (laughs) You who are listening to me speak, I am very confident that you want our assembly to continue and to grow. You want to be part of what God is doing among us and through us, and that's wonderful. And furthermore, I know many of you have been concerned about our church family. You've been praying. You've reached out. You've done what you can to help people in our congregation and in the community. Uh, I don't for a moment think that this flood could be the end for our church. Not at all. The message is simply this. That where we go from here is up to you. It's up to each one of us. And whether by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ we will continue steadfastly in these essential things like those nameless Christians in Jerusalem did. Maybe we're going to have to do our Sunday worship like we're doing it today for a little while longer. Will you commit to getting on to YouTube and listening to the message? Will you continue to give your attention to the Apostles' doctrine when it is preached and through whatever medium it comes? Will you do what you can to have fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Will you make that phone call, send that text message, invite people into your house, attend one of our home groups? Will you persist in praying, praying for others in our church family, praying with others when there is opportunity? And then when we're able to be together for Sunday worship, will you be there? Will you make that a priority week after week? Because church is so important to you. Because you love Jesus, you love his people, and you love the proclamation of his life-giving gospel. What could be more important than that? Brothers and sisters, We have very little in earthly terms. The flood has reminded us of that, but we actually have all we need. Our church is in God's hands. He is sovereign. We are totally dependent on him. But at the same time, it's also true that our church is in our hands. That's what has been pressed home to me over the last couple of weeks. Whether our church continues and grows, whether it serves as a place of encouragement and uplift, whether it is a healthy and joyful place in which to raise our children and grow old in the faith, whether it impacts our community with the gospel, is up to you. It's up to each one of us. The Christians in Jerusalem They continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. By God's grace, may we do the same. Amen.